So my name is Lindsay Jacks. I work at the Cadasta Foundation as a developer. Just a little bit about myself before we get started. I'm originally from Arkansas. My background is in anthropology. I was indoctrinated into open source, open data at the Sunlight Foundation and decided I wanted to become a programmer because I thought fundraising was super boring, but staring at three lines of code for three hours was exciting. Uh, <laughs> I'm new to the mapping community, but I'm excited to find a place where my entire background can be packaged up into a nice little bow um, so that all of my skills can be utilized. Um, so I'm excited to have seen field papers in so many of the other presentations today. I had no idea how many people were actually using it when I started working on this. Um, so you've probably heard a lot of like, and we use field papers moving on without any explanation of what it actually is. And so I will eventually get to that, but I'm going to build suspense for just a little while longer because I want to talk about the why before getting to the what. So for the first little bit, I'm going to focus on the following question. How do we increase participation in community mapping projects? So this is a pretty broad question. And so let's come up with a goal for our hypothetical community mapping project. Let's say that we want to involve more community members in the mapping project so that they feel ownership of the project. It's our belief at Cadasta that if you want the effects of your project to last, you need to make sure you get buy-in from the people most effective, affected. If they feel ownership of the project throughout the process, it's more likely to have a lasting impact. So in order to do that, we're going to break that down into two more things. We want to lower the barrier to participation for people that are interested but intimidated by the process. How do we ensure that we're not leaving people out who are unfamiliar with the process or the tools that we're using? And two, we, two, we want to find a way to include people who would normally be left out due to a lack of resources or technology. In many situations, especially in the nonprofit world, you're working with limited funding. So how do you spend your resources to ensure that you're involving the most people or getting the most bang for your buck? Depending on what methods you choose, you'll have to include training in these costs because training is essential to addressing our first problem of lowering the barrier to participation. So when you're looking at lowering barriers and trying to work within resource constraints, you need to know what your options are. At Cadasta, we partner with nonprofits to help them find the best methods for collecting and storing property rights information. We provide a customized set of tools to find the best way for each individual community to map their own information. What works for community A isn't necessarily going to work for community B because of a difference in resources, demographics, and size. For example, when we partnered with Kosovo, their cadastral agency, in conjunction with World Bank Kosovo, um, our focus was on mapping the property rights of women in the village who didn't have good documentation or had documentation in the names of their missing male husbands um, or relatives. When we joined them, they had already collected high-resolution imagery from drones. Uh, so what they were interested in doing was using mobile technology to replace ba paper-based technology, paper-based methods. <laughs> Uh, so by the time we joined, they already had the imagery and they already had technology. So moving forward with tools like GeoOpen Data Kit totally made sense. However, not every group that we work with is necessarily going to have access to this high resolution imagery. That would be awesome, but totally unrealistic. In some cases, they might not even have access to mobile technology, let alone flying technology. Because of this, we have a collection of tools and make suggestions and recommendations based on what makes sense for each unique case. So let's talk about resource utilization first, because this is uh, a topic that many nonprofit workers lose sleep over. Chances are, if you're a nonprofit, you have limited resources and technology is expensive, because this is the world that we live in. So to make sure that we're choosing the right tools, um, when starting any project at Cadasta, we always ask ourselves the following questions. What is the problem we're trying to solve? What are the existing tools? Do these existing tools meet our needs? If they don't, can they be modified? And finally, what is the cost? And not only the actual cost of the technology, but for staff time and maintenance. Something to keep in mind when answering these questions is that introducing any new tool takes time, money, and effort. The engine room put together a great uh, primer on rainforest technology and choosing the tools that you're working with within these projects. If you get the chance to check it out, I highly recommend it. Um, but if you're looking at um, 
the cost of the tools and the cost of the staff time and the training. You better make sure that what you're choosing is worth it. New technology and mobile technology and drone technology are all great, and in many cases, they're the correct answer. When we worked with Kosovo, uh, we confirmed that using tablets and tools like GODK Collect versus traditional paper methods and surveys, they didn't add any additional time, and they produced more accurate data. It solved our problem, it was cost effective, and it could be modified to fit our needs. So it was a win-win all around. So yay, go team. And this is all great, but there's a reason we test these methods before we commit to them. We have to put a lot of thought into what we're doing. Does the benefit outweigh the cost, literally and figuratively? Does the introduction of these tools produce a barrier to participation that wouldn't have been there otherwise? In the case of Kosovo, they had the infrastructure in place to quickly adopt to this form of data collection, so it made total sense. In a situation with less funding and less technology, you should need to consider other options. For example, let's say we're collecting property data in a remote village with minimal access to mobile technology. So what are the tools that exist to solve our problem? There are so many. In the mapping universe, we have GPS devices, we have Open Data Kit, we have Open Map Kit, we have drones, and the list goes on, because it's an exciting time to be alive. Do the existing tools meet our specific needs? Yes, absolutely, they all meet our needs, fantastic. If they don't meet our needs, can they be modified to do so? Eh, maybe, depending on what you're choosing. If you want to mess with Open Map Kit or Open Data Kit, absolutely. If you want to hack on a drone, be my guest, but that's gonna take a little more time. And finally, what is the cost? And this is sort of where it falls apart for this example. Technology is expensive, devices break, batteries need charging, parts need replacing, people need training. So sure it would be awesome if we could have a small fleet of drones, a pile of tablets, and enough GPSs to arm the entire village, but that's expensive. And given the background of the village, there's a chance that they would need more training. So there are a ton of variables you have to consider before just jumping on with what's new and exciting. Whether or not we're willing to sacrifice some of the benefits of this technology should depend on how it affects participation, because technology still needs humans. When you're looking at the technology you're choosing, you should think about the number of people that will be able to be involved and what kind of training is required, which is reliant on a number of factors, including sophistication of the technology and the prior knowledge of the community. In Kosovo, training took a half day. In a village of people unfamiliar with mobile technology, it would take a bit longer. Much like the choice of technology, the amount of training will be unique to the community that you're working with. So let's think about that remote village again. Say you have the resource to purchase some tablets. You decide that a few people with tablets is going to be a lot faster and more accurate and ultimately cheaper than training an entire village on something else. So that's where you decide to put your resources. And that's a legitimate choice. So you buy a couple of tablets and you train two people to use them. Great, so now these people know how to use tablets so they can run the project. But because they now know how to use computers, they decide to move to a city and actually get paid for the knowledge that you imparted on them, taking your entire project with them. So congratulations, you improved the lives of two people. Um, now this, this is not something that happens every single time, obviously it's a rare case, but it does happen on occasion and it's something that you need to take into consideration. Uh, while it might be more cost effective to train a small group of people, the problem is that you can't rely on them to remain in the community forever. If one person decides to move and take all the knowledge with them, your project dies. If the knowledge is spread across a wider pool of people, it will less likely be a problem. In addition to decreasing the risk of your project moving to a different city, the more people you involve, the more access to information that you have. Participatory mapping, the emphasis here is my own, is based on the premise that local inhabitants have expert knowledge of their local environments. You have to get people involved because they know more than you. I'm gonna repeat that, you have to get people involved. If you don't, you're missing out on your greatest pool of information. You're cheating yourself, you're cheating your project, and worst of all, you're cheating the community that you're trying to help. The biggest lesson you can learn when working with other communities is that you don't know the answers. You don't even know the right questions until you get there and start talking to the people that are living it day to day. It's also really hard to get people to care about the work that you're doing if you don't include them in the process. Your project won't go over well and it won't last past its end date. So what now? Let's look back at that remote village again. What's our problem? Our problem is that we're working with a community with limited access to mobile technology and you have limited resources. Some possible solutions are you could spend your money on drones, which would be super cool. Uh, but you get zero community buy-in aside from vague curiosity. 
you could get a couple of computers and train two people, but we've talked about some of the risks of consolidating all of your information to a small group. You could maybe buy more tablets, but then you're leaving people out who are intimidated by the process or limited, arbitrarily limiting the number of people that can participate because there's only so much tech to go around. So the technology that we've been implementing in every other situation suddenly doesn't work. So what do we do? Don't spend time and money on new technology if a good solution already exists. And I would argue that sometimes a pen and paper is the best option. At Cadasta, we know that we don't work in a void. We're constantly looking for projects that we can contribute to that not only benefit our goals, but help others reach theirs as well. Even with all of these advances, we still rely heavily on a paper-based approach to data collection, and we're always looking for ways to improve even this simple approach. And all of this led us to da, 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 field papers. All right, you stuck around this long? Let's talk about field papers. So Field Papers is a tool that was built by Stamen Group that allows you to select an area on a map, print it out onto paper, take it out into the field, mark all over it, take a picture of said paper, load it back up, and edit your annotations. And if that sounds super vague, it's because it is. And I would argue that the fact that it's vague is actually a good thing. Um, it's simple, it's easy, and it's open-ended. There's not a whole lot to say about it, and that's really the beauty of the project. So I'll walk through it now, just so that it makes a little bit more sense, because it's easier once you see what actually happens. I'm not doing a live demo, because I'm not brave enough. So <laughs> when you visit fieldpapers.org, uh, you're presented with this page. You'll click on Make Yourself an Atlas. What you'll see there is a page with grids on it, and the grids represent individual pieces of paper. You can adjust the number of grids, you can adjust the paper size, width, orientation, you can change the base map so that if you're worried about conserving ink, you can use black and white. If you don't care about ink, you can use satellite imagery. Once you've found the area that you want to work on, you'll download it, or you'll, you'll click Make an Atlas, and from here, you can download it as a PDF. Um, and at this point, you'll get these pieces of paper, which you might have seen in some other presentations. It ha the dots there are for geo-referencing once you load it back in, and the QR code connects your physical map to the map that's actually in field papers. You'll take it out in the field, write all over it to your heart's content, obviously super, super official data. Um, and then once you're done, you're going to take a picture of this and load it back into field papers, which looks super unexciting, but What's cool is that you can then take it into the ID editor and trace your annotations straight into OSM. You don't need a GPS to make a map or learn fancy GIS software to use field papers. Field papers fills a need for Cadasta and many of its partners because it's easy to use, it's cost effective, and in many instances, it's fit for purpose at hand. It allows people to stretch their resources and it requires a limited amount of training because you're presenting people with a familiar tool. Many of the partners that we work with are already familiar with the idea of community and participatory mapping, but the problem is that so much of this information that's collected never goes anywhere. Field Papers bridges that gap because it allows you to enter everything that you've collected straight into OSM. And if you saw the Possum talk yesterday, they talked about how you can go out into the field, collect data, upload it right away, and then immediately print out another Field Papers, which now has the new data, so you're constantly building on the work that you're doing. It gives participatory mapping projects life beyond the paper that they're collected on. If any of you are run or attended community mapping projects, like the Mapping DC that was presented earlier, Field Papers provides a unique opportunity to make it easier for people to get up and go. There's less fear about messing up real data in OSM, there's no need for everyone to have the same operating system, and they can, there's no concern about running out of battery, and at the end, all of this information still goes back into OSM. I'm not encouraging people not to use OSM, I'm encouraging you to find new and creative ways to get other people to contribute, people who are outside of the community, um, who aren't sure how they would be able to contribute. They don't have to understand anything about open mapping to understand field papers. Because field papers is open source, Cadasta was able to get involved and make improvements to the project. Um, and after some initial contributions, Cadasta partnered with Outreachy to sponsor an intern to update the UI of the Atlas page. The old field papers, Consist oh. The old field papers consisted of four steps, search, select, describe, and layout. And the two main issues that continued to pop up on the GitHub account was that this process was a bit confusing and the actual creation 
stage was far too small to be able to like navigate comfortably. So what we focused on and what the final design looked like was we took these four steps, meshed them all onto one page, and pushed them all over to the side so that the focus could be on the actual full screen map. The process is all right there so the user can see everything that they have to do before moving on. And we also simplified the grid interaction, which if anyone has used the old field papers was um, pretty tough to navigate. You had to sort of drag the map, then drag the grid, then drag the map, then drag the grid. This one behaves a bit more like the lens of a camera. So as you, you scroll across, the grid goes with you. And we have a lot more plans for field papers. We want to turn it into an isolated reusable component that can be plugged into any software. Currently, uh, it's locked into fieldpapers.org, which is built on a Rails application. Inside of that is the leaflet in JavaScript. And then the actual conversion to PDF happens in Python. So we want to sort of tease all of that out and make it an isolated component that people can plug and play into any website or any software, because we think that this has application outside of where it's currently reaching. We want to update the georeferencing system. Um, so the dots are fine and they work, but with the advancements in image recognition software, we think we can take advantage of that. Because currently, if you fill in the dots or play connect the dots with the dots, they don't work and they cover up part of the map, which isn't super convenient. We also want to increase the capacity for UAV and high quality imagery. Uh, we actually tried to use field papers in Kosovo with the imagery that they had collected, um, but it wasn't quite set up to handle that. It can handle satellite imagery, but it's not quite ready for that level of detail, and we want to take full advantage of that. And after seeing the possum talk yesterday, I personally would like to make it mobile friendly. Um, when we initially worked on it, we talk to the community a little bit, but without seeing how people were using it day to day, it was tough to make these assumptions. So we focused on desktop only, but I would like to make that work within the Possum system that's been uh, set up. So we obviously have a lot of hopes and dreams for field papers, um, but we're still figuring out the best way to go about it. If any of these you find particularly interesting or you think you have a great solution for it, we're working on it tomorrow during the code sprints, and we would love to hear from you, and we would love to have people join us. Um, I personally love field papers because it's a way to get people involved and to send them out into the field with more confidence than they would have had otherwise. And it would be great if other people joined in on, on it. So thank you. Questions? Yes. with my students in Colombia in oh, high school. Cool. Our best math was, was made with, with field papers. I have a question. Yes. We work with field papers and a tasking manager in, instance. Okay. Uh, is possible more integration between the field papers and tasking manager? For example, the, the same area for the tasking manager, for the field paper? Uh, I, got, I got an absolutely from Seth. He's very excited about this, so yes. Okay. Seth <laughs> is one of the original designers that I met this weekend for the first time. <laughs> So, yes, yes. Okay, great. <laughs> yes. Um, when people are talking about particularly in more density, uh, areas with a higher density of, of, of features, mm -hmm. uh, and thickness, and color, uh, being able to make out what people are writing or doing, how do you overcome those kinds of challenges? Right, so I haven't tested this a whole lot, but just from the little bit that I've played with it, um, the higher quality the image, the better it's going to... So I took this with my phone, and you can tell that it's pretty spotty because the lighting wasn't great. Um, and you have to get pretty close to it to be able to actually edit it in OSM. So the more zoomed in you are on the space, the better it's going to be because you won't be able to see the actual like markings until you get close enough. It won't, it won't appear at a certain like zoomed out level. Right, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Tile resolution. Um, and also, what's nice about this is, is they can do their best and it can be cre cre uh, corrected on the end because you're not editing data straight in. You have the chance to sort of toy with it at the end if things aren't quite right. 
Um, so uh, filled papers is excellent for very dense uh, areas. We've used filled papers in Dhaka in Bangladesh, which is the densest city in the world. The, you know, go check out the OSM data there. Um, that was all done using filled papers and open map kit. So it's absolutely possible. Uh, pen width is not really an issue. Um, the cool thing about when you say colors, we'd love to see some color OCR. If you draw red, what does it mean? If you draw blue, what does that mean? So you don't have to, you have to do less drawing. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Question from one of the Wikipedians in the room. Uh, so I'm, I've gotten bits and pieces of this throughout the weekend, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm excited by what I see here, but I'm still not quite following the um, total workflow. Okay. So I'm wondering if there's a place that where you've got documented on a website somewhere what kind of the, the process is from start to finish. I think it'd be really helpful if I could take a look at that, because I'm, I'm thinking of some applications where we might be able to do some joint stuff. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if there's like specific lined out start to finish, there definitely should be. Um, but what's nice about it is that it's simple enough you can kind of walk through it and play with it on your own. That's almost the best way to sort of figure it out. Um, because it is a fairly simple process and it's fairly vague until you actually get in there and do it. Um, so it's, it's simple, you're not editing any actual data, so just toying around with it is probably the best way to figure things out. Yes. Could you clarify? The so. point being, you have to run events, okay? Mm -hmm. And you need an administrative unit, which is basic. Sometimes it is basic and you can do it with a user selection, but sometimes it's not. Right, yeah. Is there any experience where you have been working that has set somehow units to survey or not? Within the this scheme? Um, not so my personal experience. Uh, Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. So I, I think to answer your question, you can change the base map that you're working with and you can also add your own tiles. So if you're looking at specifying certain features, is that what you're saying? Yeah, but uh, a geometric feature, mm -hmm. not exactly a feature, spatial object. Right. It's a unit, it's covered like, let's say, 10 houses, kind of hard. Yeah, so you, you could, you could um, add your own base map, it, so we can integrate with other tools to make that happen. If you add your own base map, you can sort of cover whatever you want, and it'll still print out whatever you're seeing, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Time for one more? Yes. Um, so, a question I've had about field papers, as somebody who used to work for the company who made field papers, is, is there an easy way to get, or is there an easy way to, and is there a reason to not put the data into OpenStreetMap? And is there like a way to put it into an, a, a separate database if you need to? Yeah, so um, like the last talk I was talking about, there's sometimes data that's not appropriate to put straight into OSM. You can use it in other editors. So this just creates a base layer map that you can then export to other editors depending on what you want to use. So this, this picture that you end up with here is just that extra custom base layer. Cool, thank you.